What caused Venus and Mars to shift their orbits? When Venus became a new member of the solar system, it moved on a stretched ellipse and for centuries imperiled the other planets. Because of its dangerous circling, Venus was diligently observed in both hemispheres, and records were kept of its movement. In the last centuries before this era, the 225-day year of Venus, and apparently also its orbit, were practically the same as in modern times. As early as the second half of the 7th century before this era, Venus, watched with anxiety, had already ceased to be a cause of dreadful expectation. It probably reached, then, the orbital stage in which it was found in the last centuries before this era, and where we still find it today. What caused the change in the orbit of Venus? I shall pose another problem besides the first. Mars did not arouse any fears in the hearts of the ancient astrologers, and its name was seldom mentioned in the second millennium. In Assyrio-Babylonia, in inscriptions made before the 9th century, the name of Nurgle is found only on rare occasions. On the astronomical ceiling of Sinmut, Mars does not appear among the planets. It did not play any conspicuous part in the early mythology of the celestial gods. But in the 9th or 8th century before this era, the situation changed radically. Mars became the dreaded planet. Accordingly, Mars Nurgle rose to the position of the frightful storm and war god. The question must then present itself. Why, previous to the time, did Mars signify no danger to the Earth? And what caused Mars to shift its orbit nearer to the Earth? The planets of the solar system move in nearly the same plane. And if one planet were to revolve along a stretched ellipse, it would endanger the other planets. The two problems, what caused Venus to change its orbit, and what caused Mars to change its orbit, may have a common explanation. The common cause may have been some comet which changed the orbits of Venus and Mars, but it is simpler to suppose that the two planets, one of which had a greatly elongated orbit, collided and that no third agent was necessary to bring about that result. A conflict between Venus and Mars, if it occurred, might well have been a spectacle observable from the Earth. It is not impossible that the two planets came repeatedly into contact, each time with different results. If a contact between Venus and Mars really occurred and was observed from the Earth, it must have been commemorated in traditions or literary monuments. When was the Elad created? A mighty strife had waxen great within the members of the sphere. While it's raining outside, that's pretty cool. We got a little thunderstorm going on with my window open. I don't know if you can hear it yet. When was the Iliad created? A mighty strife had waxen great within the members of the sphere. Empedocles. I wonder if that's where we get the word impede from. To this day, it has not been established at what date the Iliad and the Odyssey were composed. Even ancient authors differ greatly in reckoning the time when Homer lived. It was established to be as late as 685 BC. The historian Theopompus, and as early as 1159 BC, certain authorities quoted by Philostratus. Herodotus wrote that Homer and Hesiod created the Greek pantheon not more than 400 years before me, which would mean not prior to 884 BC or 484 BC being regarded as the year of Herodotus' birth. The question is still debated. Some authors argue that there was a long interval between the time when the epic works of Homer were composed and the time when they were put into writing. Others think that these works must have been created not long before the Greeks acquired the art of writing, about 700 BC. It is also argued that the Greeks must have known this art long before 700 BC. On the assumption that Homeric works were created much before that date, it is generally assumed that the fall of Troy annotated Homer 
by several generations, and also the great epic works were the creation of generations. The fall of Troy is sometimes thought to have taken place in the 12th century. On the other hand, it has been shown that the cultural background of the Homeric epos is that of the 8th or even the 7th century. The Age of Iron was well underway, and many other details would preclude an earlier scene. It is highly probable that the Homeric works were created at that time or shortly thereafter. Whether these poems were first sung by a bard who lived centuries after the destruction of Troy depends on the time when Troy was destroyed. The tradition about Aeneas, who saved when Troy was captured, went to Carthage, a city built in the 9th century, and from there to Italy, where he founded Rome, a city first built in the middle of the 8th century, implies that Troy was destroyed in the 8th or late 9th century. But for what purpose do I burden my present work with this question? It may seem that the two problems, how Venus changed its orbit to a circle, and how Mars changed its orbit so as to come in contact with the Earth, are weighted with a third problem. From a far removed feel and in itself complicated, and even if these matters have something in common, how can a problem with three unknowns be solved? We shall come closer to a solution of the astronomical problem with which we are concerned and the problem of the epics of Troy. If we recognize the cosmic scene of these epics, a simple test can be made. If Ares, the Mars of the Greeks, is not mentioned in the creations of Homer, this would support the view that the Iliad and Odyssey were created in the 10th century or earlier, or at least that the drama they describe had taken place not later than this time. But if Ares is presented as a war god in these epics, it would indicate that they were composed in the 8th century or thereafter. It was in the 8th century that Mars Nurgle, an obscure deity, became a prominent god epic poems rich in mythology that originated in the 8th or 7th century would not be silent about Mars, Ares, who became outrageous at that time. With this yardstick at hand, the epic poems of Homer must be re-examined. The task will not be difficult. The Iliad is full of descriptions of the violent deeds of Ares, and in this epic the story is told of the battles which the Greeks, besieging Troy, waged against the people of Priam, king of Troy. Deities took a prominent part in these battles and skirmishes. Two of them, Athene and Ares, were by far the most active. Athene was the protectress of the Greeks. Ares was on the side of the Trojans. They were the chief antagonists throughout the Epopi. At first, Athene removed Ares from the battlefield and flashing-eyed Athene took furious Ares by the hand and spake to him, saying, Ares, Ares, thou bane of mortals, thou bloodstained stormer of walls, shall we not now leave the Trojans and Achaeans to fight? She led furious Ares forth from the battle, but they met together again in the field. Furious Ares was abiding on the left of the battle. Aphrodite, the goddess of the moon, wished to participate in the war also. But Zeus, presiding in heavenly Olympus, told her, Not unto thee, my child, are given works of war. Nay, follow thou after the lovely works of marriage, and all these things shall be the business of swift Ares and Athene. Athena or Athene? I'm going to find out. Thus the god of the planet Jupiter admonished the goddess of the moon to leave the combat, that it might be fought out by the god of the planet Mars and the goddess of the planet Venus. Phoebus, Apollo, the god of the sun, spoke to the god of the planet Mars. Then unto furious Ares spake Phoebus, Apollo, Ares, Ares, thou bloodstained stormer of walls, wilt thou not now enter into the battle? And baneful Ares entered amid the Trojan ranks, 
he called, How long will ye still suffer your host to be slain by the Achaeans? The battlefield was darkened by Ares, and about the battle furious Ares drew a veil of night to aid the Trojans. He saw that Pallas, Athene, was departed, for she, it was that bare aid to the Danans. Hera, the goddess of the earth, stepped upon the flaming car, and self-bidden groaned upon their hinges, the gates of heaven, which the hours had in their keeping, to whom are entrusted great heavens and Olympus. She spoke to Zeus. Zeus, hast thou no indignation with Eris for these violent deeds, that he hath destroyed so great and so goodly a host of the Achaeans recklessly? Wilt thou in any wise be wroth with me if I smite Ares? And Zeus replied, Nay, come now, rouse against him, Athene, who has ever been wont above others to bring sore pain upon him. So came the hour of battle. Then Pallas, Athene, grasped the lash and the reins, and against Ares, first she speedily drave. Athene put on the cap of Hades, to the end that mighty Ares should not see her. Ares, the bane of mortals, was attacked by Polly's Athene, who sped the spear mightily against his nethermost belly. Then brazen Ares bellowed loud as nine thousand warriors or ten thousand cry in battle when they join in the strife of the war god. Even as a black darkness appeareth from the clouds, when after heat a blustering wind ariseth, even in such wise did brazen Ares appear, as he fared amid the clouds unto broad heaven. In heaven he appealed to Zeus, with bitter words of complaint against Athene. With thee are we all at strife, for thou art father to that mad and baneful maid, whose mind is ever set on deeds of lawlessness. For all the other gods that are in Olympus are obedient unto thee, but to her thou payest no heed, for that this pestilent maiden is thine own child. And Zeus answered, Most hateful to me art thou of all gods that hold Olympus, forever is strife dear to thee, and wars and fightings. The first round was lost by Ares. Hera and Athene made Ares, the bane of mortals, to cease from his manslaying. In his vein, the poem proceeds, its allegorical features being only too readily overlooked. In the fifth book of the Iliad, Ares is called by name more than thirty times, and throughout the poem, he never disappears from the scene, whether in the sky or on the battleground. The twentieth and twenty-first books describe the climax of the battle of the gods at the walls of Troy. Athene would utter her loud cry, and over against her spouted Ares, dread as a dark whirlwind, calling with shrill tones to the Trojans. Thus did the blessed gods urge onto the two hosts to clash in battle, and amid them made grievous strife to burst forth. Then terribly thundered the father of gods, and men from on high and from beneath did Poseidon cause the vast earth to quake, and the steep crests of the mountains. All the roots of many fountained Ida were shaken, and all her peaks, and the city of the Trojans, and the ships of the Achaeans, and seized with fear in the world below, was Adinius, lord of the shades, lest above him the earth be cloven by Poseidon the shaker of earth, and his abode be made plain to view for mortals and immortals. So great was the din that arose when the gods clashed in strife. In this battle of gods above and beneath, Trojans and Echians clashed. Together the whole universe roared and shivered. The battle was fought in gloom. Hera spread a thick mist. The river rushed with surging flood and roused all his streams tumultuously. Even the ocean was inspired with fear of the lightning of great Zeus and his dread thunder, when so it crasheth from heaven. Then rushed into battle a wondrous blazing fire. First on the plain was the fire kindled and burned the dead, and all the plain was parched 
Then to the river turned the gleaming flame, tormented were the eels and the fish in the eddies, and in fair streams they plunged this way and that. The fair stream seethed and boiled, nor had the river any mind to flow onward, but was stayed, unable to protect Troy. Upon the gods fell strife heavy and grievous. Together then they clashed with a mighty din, and the wide earth rang, and round about great heaven pealed as with a trumpet. Zeus, the heart within him, laughed aloud in joy as he beheld the gods joining in strife. Ares began the fray, and first leapt upon Athene, raising spear in hand, and spake a word of reviling. These passages sound like they were written by Shakespeare or Francis Bacon. Wherefore now again, thou dogfly, art thou making gods to clash with gods in strife? Rememberest thou not what time thyself in sight of all didst, didst grasp the spear? and let drive straight at me, and didst rend my fair flesh. Uh, this second encounter between Ares and Athene was also lost by Ares. He, Ares, smote upon her tasseled aegis. Thereon, blood-stained Ares smote with his long spear, but she gave ground and seized with her stout hand a stone that lay upon the plain black and jagged and great. Therewith she smote furious Ares on the neck and loosened his limbs. Pallas Athene broke into a laugh. Fool, not even yet hast thou learned how much mightier than thou I avow me to be, than that thou matchest thy strength with mine. Aphrodite came to the wounded Ares. So Aphrodite is the moon took him by the hand and sought to lead him away but Athene sped in pursuit she smote Aphrodite on the breast with her stout hand and her heart melted and her heart melted sounds like it would be the seas of the moon these excerpts from the Iliad show that some cosmic drama was projected upon the fields of Troy the commenters were aware that originally Ares was not merely the god of war, and that this quality is a deduced and secondary one. The Greek Ares is the Latin planet Mars. It is so stated in classic literature a multitude of times. In the so-called Homeric poems, too, it is said that Ares is a planet. The Homeric hymn to Ares reads, Most mighty Ares, chieftain of valor, revolving thy fiery circle in ether among the seven wandering stars planets where thy flaming steeds ever uplift thee above the third chariot but what might it mean that the planet mars destroys cities or that the planet mars is ascending in the sky in a darkened cloud or that it engages athene the planet venus in battle Ares must have represented some elements in nature. Guess the commentators. Ares must have been the personification of the raging storm, or the god of the sky, or the god of light, or a sun god, and so on. These explanations are futile. Ares Mars is what his name says, the planet Mars. I find in Lucian a statement which corroborates my interpretation of the the cosmic drama in the Iliad. This author of the second century of the present era writes in his book on astrology this most significant and most neglected commentary on the Homeric epics. All that he, Homer, hath said of Venus and Mars and of Mars, his passion, is also manifestly composed from no other source than this science, astrology. Indeed, it is the conjecture of Venus and Mars that creates the poetry of Homer. Lucian is unaware that Athene is the goddess of the planet Venus, and yet he knows the real meaning of the cosmic plot of the Homeric epic, which shows that the sources of his instruction in astrology were cognizant of the facts of the celestial drama. My interpretation of the Homeric poem 
I find, has been anticipated by still others. Who they were, it is impossible to say, however. Heraclitus Heraclitus, a little-known author of the first century, who should not be confused with the philosopher Heraclitus of Ephesus, wrote a work on Homeric allegories. In his opinion, Homer and Plato were the two greatest spirits of Greece, and he tried to reconcile the anthropomorphic and satiric description of gods by Homer with the idealistic and metaphysical approach of Plato. In paragraph 53 of his allegories, Heraclitus, Heraclitus, <laughs> Heraclitus confutes those who think that the battles of the gods in the Iliad signify collisions of the planets. Thus I find that some of the ancient philosophers must have held the same opinion at which I arrived independently after a series of deductions. The problem of the date when the Homeric epics originated was raised here to be solved with the help of this criterion. If the cosmic battle between the planets Venus and Mars is mentioned there, then the epics could not have originated much before the year 800 BC. If the Earth and Moon and the Moon were involved in this struggle, the time of the birth of the Iliad must be lowered to 747 BC at least, and probably to an even later date. The first earth-shaking contact with our planet had already taken place, and for this reason Ares is repeatedly called Bane of Mortals, Blood-Stained Stormer of Walls. Homer was thus at the earliest a contemporary of the prophets, Amos and Isaiah, or more likely he lived shortly after them. The Trojan War and the Cosmic Conflict were synchronous. The time of Homer was not separated from the time of the Trojan War by several centuries, possibly not even by a single one. The statement by Lucian regarding the inspiring drama of the Homeric epics, the conjunction of the planets Venus and Mars can be refined. There was more than one fateful conjunction between Venus and Mars. At least two are described in the Iliad. In the 5th and 21st books, the conjunctions were near contacts. The mere passage of one planet in front of another could not have provided material for a cosmic drama. Well, we know now that it can exchange thunderbolts, and I thought that's where he was going to. The conjunctions were near contacts. The mere passage of one planet in front of another could not have provided material for a cosmic drama. I guess that would depend on how far away from each other they were. But he knows that. That's why I don't quite get that statement right now. Hmm. End of subchapter. Stay tuned, part two is on its way very soon.